So that's coming up, and uh, let us join together then in singing our opening song together once in Royal David City. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue by singing as we light our Advent wreath. Son of 
shower, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds rain down righteousness. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. The measuring line goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. Praise the Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But But if if we we confess confess our sins, sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we take a moment of silence to reflect on God's word and examine our own lives. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by by what we have have left undone. undone. We We have have not loved you with our whole heart. We We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Together we speak our intro together. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. Oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. With the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Glory be be to the the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. We continue by singing our hymn of praise. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come among us with your abiding presence. 
By the power of your Spirit, direct our lives to expressions of repentant joy. Bless our devotion and our prayers, and lead us in ways of faithfulness as we await your final coming in glory. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament reading for <clears throat> this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 7, starting at verse 10, uh, which will be the basis for our meditation and message uh, this morning. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heavens. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David, is it not enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey, and when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. But before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the, hand, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle. Romans 1, 1 through 7. um, Paul greets the saints in Rome with the words of blessing. Paul and the servant is as a servant of Christ, Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart from the gospel of God. The, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Regarding his son, who as a, his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with the power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and for his name's sake, we receive the grace and an apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to be obedient to that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Lord, word of the Lord. Please stand as you're able as we honor our Lord Jesus Christ and his ministry. Together we say, Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. Alleluia. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the first chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. All this took place to fulfill what the, what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means 
God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated as the children are welcome to come forward for a children's message at this time. <laughs> Morning, Charlie. How are you? Come on up, boys and girls. Hi, everybody. How are you? Is it cold outside? Yeah. Are any, of you, are any of your hands still a little chilly and cold right now? Raise your hand if they're still chilly and cold. No? Not, no ones? Well, that's good. That's good. Hi, Cora. All right, Everly, can you sit right here? Good. Good job. Say, so, boys and girls, uh, last week we talked a little bit about some candles. Uh, uh, Dawson had brought Jesus back, and we talked a little bit about uh, uh, Jesus last week being the light of the world. Uh, and up here, it looks a little bit different. Can you girls look back over here, Cora? Can you look over here? Does it look a little bit different than it usually does? Yeah. What are you guys going to do later on as, as, as the Sunday school kids? What are you guys going to do? Can anyone tell me? What are you going to do? Christmas program. You're just going to do a Christmas program? That's what you're going to do? Nice. Are you excited about that? Yeah. Good. That's good. I think it's going to be exciting. I saw it yesterday, and it's good. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, so things have changed up here a little bit, but there's one thing that, that didn't change that we're still doing, uh, and, and it's over here on this side. Do you guys know what, what this is right over here, this big thing right over here? Do you guys see this? Cora, you want to come and see it? Here, come here. Do you see what this is? What is this? Can anyone tell me? What is that? You, you light the white one until Christmas, and before that, you light all the candles. But maybe you guys have noticed this. Let's come sit down over here, girls. Maybe you, maybe you have noticed this. How many candles do we have lit today? Four of the candles. Last Sunday, do you remember how many we had lit? We only had three. Really? Why? Can anyone tell me why that is? Why did we only have three candles lit, Charlie? It was the third Sunday in Advent. That's right. So there's always four Sundays as we prepare for whose birthday? She said it right there. It was Christmas. Who's, whose birthday do we celebrate on Christmas? Jesus' birthday. Yeah. But these candles, they all mean something. They've all, and we sang them earlier. Each candle represents one thing for us to remember. The first week, this candle represents hope. Can you say the word hope? Hope? Hope. Yeah, yeah, hope. The first candle represents hope. The second candle represents love. Can you guys say love? Love. Good. And this third candle is what we go to next. What color is this candle? Pink. Yeah, this pink candle represents joy because it means we're halfway to celebrating Jesus' birthday. And that's an exciting thing. Have you guys ever made it halfway through a test and you were super excited? Yeah, yeah. That's when you get joy because it's almost here and done. And the last candle is the candle of peace. Can you girls say peace? Peace. Good job, good job. So that's what those four candles represent. So you can remember in Advent that Jesus brings you, what were the four words we learned? Let's say them together. Hope, love, joy, peace. Good job. All right, let's fold our hands and we'll pray and give thanks to God for all four of those things. And if you're a big person in the pew, you can pray with us too. Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for being our hope, our love, our joy, and our peace. Please help us, Please help us. To, show to show others you. you. In, Jesus name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, boys and girls, you can head back to your seats. 
And as they do that, we join together in singing our hymn of the day, Gentle Mary Laid Her Child. mercy and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen indeed. It is good to be together this morning. In Isaiah chapter 7, our Old Testament reading, we hear some familiar words. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. And who is this Emmanuel? I mean, you get the easiest answer this morning. It's the classic Sunday school answer. Who's, who's this Emmanuel? Can anyone tell me? Jesus. Yeah, you can be confident about it. Who's this Emmanuel? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, it is Jesus who is this Emmanuel. We know this word, although it's not the most famous verses in the Bible ever, especially around Christmas time when you hear the word Emmanuel, you think of those words, O come, O come, Emmanuel, right? Emmanuel, which means, as Matthew in our gospel reading says, God with us. God with us. And as much, but as much as excitement as we might have about seeing this prophecy of a virgin giving birth, and we know that it's Jesus, as much as excitement as we might have for that, <laughs> the one who was originally given this prophecy, King Ahaz, probably was not thrilled to hear about it. When we read Isaiah chapter 7, we're kind of dropped into a long-going situation and conversation that's going on between God and Isaiah. And as Isaiah looks out in the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom, it's not a good thing of what Isaiah sees. And what we find in the life of Ahaz, the king who is supposed to be steadfast and accountable to God and representing God in the world, we find some clarity about what developing unbelief and faithlessness looks like. Now, why would we want to look at this this morning? Why would we want to learn about someone who develops unbelief and faithlessness faithlessness. Well, it's in order that we might see how gracious 
our God actually is in the midst of faithlessness. So here's a little background about Ahaz, the king. He becomes king of Judah at the ripe age of, you guessed it, 20 years old. It says in 2 Kings chapter 16 that Ahaz takes the throne when he is just 20 years old. Now I want you to think for a moment, if you're approaching the age of 20, what would you consider your life to be like now? If you think back to your life when you were 20, what did you consider yourself to be? Was it someone who was unstoppable? immovable, invincible, could take on anything, could stay up till two o'clock in the morning and get up at five to go to work and have a 12-hour shift and then, or, or try and finish your homework at two o'clock in the morning <laughs> and then hopefully turn it in at eight o'clock that same morning. When you were 20, how did you see yourself? Surprising thing, probably not surprising thing, is that no matter what age you were, what what time period you were born at, the age of 20 is a time when we all consider ourselves higher than we ought to. We think that we're invincible and can take anything on. We've got lots of energy. There's bright hope and future and promise. Our lives are just starting off. Now imagine you uh, wake up one day and they say, well, you're the king now (laughs) at the age of 20. Finally, you get to take hold of all those things that you had only dreamed of doing one day, and now you get to do them. And yet, What happens to Ahaz is when he begins to find out that he isn't unstoppable, that he isn't invincible, this is what 2 Chronicles chapter 28 says about him. In the time of his distress, that's what it always happens for us (laughs) 20-year-olds, in the time of his distress, Ahaz became yet more faithless to the Lord. In the time of his distress, Ahaz became yet more faithless to the Lord. How does that happen? How does that happen? For Ahaz, it started with himself. Having pride in himself, And yet, Scripture goes on to actually show us what happened inside of Ahaz's heart and in his mind and what actions it drove him to which led him on a path of unbelief and faithlessness. Second Chronicles goes on to say this, Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God and cut them in pieces, the vessels of the house of God, and he shut the doors of the house of the Lord. It's not just that he stopped going to church. He stopped other people from going to worship God by what he did. And it's not just that. It says in 2 Chronicles that he made himself altars in every corner of Jerusalem. Anywhere that he would stop, it'd be like uh, as many gas stations as there are in Alexandria. (laughs) You'd be able to find a altar that Ahaz could worship at. But it wasn't an altar to the Lord, for that was part of Ahaz's development of faithfulness as well as he looked out at all the other kingdoms of the world, all the other kings that were having success in their battles and their triumphs, and he thought to himself, why don't I just worship those gods if they're having so much success? But faithlessness in Ahaz's life wasn't just taking on what other people did and worshiping other gods. It affected his own family. 2 Kings chapter 16 says that Ahaz took not just one son, but more than one son 
And he went to those altars that he had made. He took his sons. He killed them, lit them on fire, and sacrificed them to those false gods. Because he had been convinced in his faithlessness that God was against him. And it's with all of that in mind that we come to the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7 where we find Ahaz face to face with God's representative of Isaiah. And God is saying not once, but it says, if you look in your Bibles on page, in Isaiah chapter 7, which is found on page 681, if you want to open up to your pew Bibles, It says in verse 10 that God, not once, but it says again, Isaiah went to Ahaz and said to him. So this is not just the first time that God is trying to call Ahaz back to living a faithful life. Isaiah says these encouraging words words to Ahaz in the midst when he, Ahaz is about to go and fight another war, Isaiah says to him, don't align yourself with only yourself and these other kingdoms. Trust in God. And Isaiah says, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as the deepest depths or as high as the highest heavens. Isn't that what happens when we're in our distress at ages, when we feel invulnerable, invincible, immovable, unshakable, when we do hit our depths and we begin to go into distress, that we would ask God for a sign and say, just give me a sign. Tell me anything, Lord, and I'll do what you need me to do. Any sign to show me that I'm going down the right path. Any sign to tell me that I'm going down the wrong path and I'll turn on the right path. even in our distress of our age when we move past our 20s, we still look for a sign to know that life is going to be preserved or changed. The beauty of this reading is certainly that there's a prophecy about a child of whom we know, that Emmanuel, right, that God with us, that that Mary the Virgin fulfills that prophecy and gives birth to Jesus. But the beauty of the reading that we don't see is that in the midst of a faithless, spineless, weak, bitter, arrogant king, God still comes to him and offers a sign. Any sign to King Ahaz. God will go to any lengths to claim his people, his creation, those he loves, away from, faithless, away from faithlessness. That's what God wants with Ahaz. He still wants him to live in a trusting and faithful relationship with God despite what's happened in the past. But when you act faithless towards God, it is never a comfort when he says that he is with you. When you act faithless towards God and he says that he is with you, it is not a comfort and it was not a comfort for Ahaz because the prophecy doesn't just end with a virgin giving birth to a son. The prophecy continues in verse 17 as it goes on to say, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. And then it says, The Lord will bring upon you and your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the days of Ephraim that they departed from Judah. And he will come, the king of Assyria. In other words, 
Ahaz, fine, since you won't come back to me, since you won't hear my word of repentance, since you don't want to be in a faithful, trusting relationship with me, I'm still going to give you a sign. Ask a sign of the Lord. Ahaz says, I'm not going to put the Lord to the test. I just won't do it. I'm too good of a man. I mean, you've been in those situations, right, where, where you've had opportunities to speak very nice Christian things because there's other people around and they're listening. That's kind of the situation that Ahaz is in in his court. He sits there as king, and the prophet comes to him and says, just ask a sign, Ahaz, please. Anything of God. And Ahaz looks around, and he sees his friends, he sees the court, and he thinks to himself, what's the right thing to do now? Well, just don't put God to the test. Don't trust And so he says, I'm not going to put the Lord, the God, to the test. I will not do it. And then God promises to be with Ahaz, but not with him in a good way. We might say that God promises to be against Ahaz. So we've seen how Ahaz has developed faithlessness and unbelief in his life. He saw what other people were doing around him that unbelievers were doing, and he began to live like them. And a continued life of unbelief and faithlessness can result in God no longer being with you, but being against you. Faith, though, in God's promises... Faith in God's promises begins to transform life. For those who live in a trusting relationship with God because they want God to be with them and know that God loves them dearly, that's where promise comes in. And faith always clings to a promise. So for example, there was this young girl who saw faith transform her life. Oftentimes she would walk around in school and and hang out with her friends, and, and one of their favorite things to do, although, was to see their teachers when they would screw up and maybe record a 30-second clip and send it to each other when they didn't have classes together, or they, or they might see their, their friends trip and fall and, and send a quick Snapchat to their friends or post it on Instagram and, and just, just tear through all of these kids just so they could, well, get a quick laugh. One of the other things that they really loved to do was look at each other and, and gossip about each other when they weren't around. But this girl, what she started to notice is that when she wasn't around, she started to wonder what they were saying about her. And every week she came to church, and and it was the same thing over and over, being called to repentance, being called to confess sins, and it was all this rote things. And there were some silly things here and there. And she might remember remember them and then say, oh yeah, you'll never guess what happened (laughs) at church on Sunday. But then over time it began to lose its flair. And she began to see that everything that she had talked about up to that point was only leading her to wonder more and more about herself and her God and how he viewed her. Maybe God really did think this way about me and how I think about myself. There was another couple, though, who started to see this call to repentance and faith as this elderly couple started to uh, uh, join in for for supper one night. And they were having a family meal, and and this elderly couple walked up to this table and and placed their food down where uh, their grandson was sitting with his fiance. And they sat down and smiled at each other and then began to dig into their food. And after a few moments passed, uh, 
uh, the, the uh, fiance, she looked at uh, her, her fiance's uh, grandparents and uh, she wanted to break the, the ice. And she said, so how long have you guys been married? The husband looked up and smiled and he said, 60 years with a beaming bright smile on his face. Suddenly, the fiance's eyebrows raised in shock, starting to think about her own life and what she was getting herself into, thinking about that daunting number. Is that something she'd have to try and live up to? So as to try and get away from that daunting notion, she tried to bring some levity to the situation, and she, she looked at them again, and she said, with a cheeky grin, so what's the secret? <laughs> and the wife looked up, looked at the engaged couple, and then looked back at her husband and smiled and said, Jesus and forgiveness are no secret." It is no secret that when you live in faithfulness towards God, He is with you and for you. But when you live a life of faithlessness and unbelief, only looking to the idols that you create in your own heart and the habits and things that you have done throughout your life, you will see that God is against you. Psalm 103, though, gives us a great promise. Psalm 103 says this about our God who is with us this day, who has come to you. It says that he does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay our iniquities according to us. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east, is that east? East is from the west. Thank you, Gary. East. I was right. Yeah, east is from the west. So far does he remove our transgressions. That's what it's like to have God with us. That's your promise that's been given to you in faith, in your baptism. Baptismal font wasn't here, sorry. (laughs) But that's the promise that you have in your baptism through that faith that was given to you. That's the promise that your faith clings to, that even despite your gossip, your relationship struggles, despite depression, whatever it might be, that in Jesus Christ you have a promise that is made to you that God is with you, not against you. God regarded Ahaz according to his sin, only after Ahaz decided to remain dead in his sin. When he had no need for God any longer, that's when God said, fine, have it your way. But that's not how God regards us according to his forgiveness, according to his son Jesus Christ, because God wants us to live toward him and towards each other in faith towards God and love toward one another. That's what Ephesians chapter 2 says, that we are alive in Christ. It goes on to say, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. God made us alive together with Christ Jesus, and so God is with you and not against you this day because he has freed you from sin to be freely given to one another. Not to look around at the world and wonder how I need to live my life in light of what they're doing and what things do I need to adopt into my life so that I can fit in with them, but rather to see that God is freely given to you and for you, and he is with you this Christmas season. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all our understanding keep and guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand as you are able as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together we confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. 
The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For the church as it awaits the final advent of our Lord, that through it the message of salvation be proclaimed and the gifts of God be shared, and for the nations of the world, that we may know times of peace and may with thankful hearts enjoy the blessings we receive. Let us pray to the Lord. As we anticipate the joys of Christmas tide, we pray for our family of faith here at Good Shepherd and for all Christian people in God's kingdom around the world. Help us to share confidently the blessings that we know in Christ, both within our family circles and beyond them. Let us pray to the Lord. We pray for those things needed by us as part of what we know to be our daily bread. And we remember people with special needs and concerns this day, especially the hospitalized, the grieving, the unemployed, and all on our hearts for whom our petitions are desired at this moment. Help us to share love without limit and offer forgiveness as we have been loved and forgiven by our gracious Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, We pray that we will not succumb to many temptations that surround us in this and every season, and we ask that we be delivered from every evil. Inspired by and thankful for the witness of faithful Christians in time past, grant that we be led in paths of faith and faithfulness. Let us pray to the Lord. For God's blessings on all who brighten these darkening days of the year, the shop workers and postal clerks, the musicians and carolers, the delivery people, and all who work long hours in these days, grant that we, being truly appreciative of all those who carry out their vocations for the betterment of our lives, and direct us to bring to you glory, for you are one God, Son, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we bring our tithes and offerings forward to support the ongoing ministry, not just here on Sunday at Good Shepherd, but throughout the entire week as we praise God with our offerings and sing. by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray by faith. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we sing our closing hymn, hymn, Jesus Came the Heavens Adoring. Thank you for being here with us this morning, members and visitors. It's glad, it's good to be, I'm glad to be together with you. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> uh, so uh, just a few announcements at 1030, coming up here shortly in a, le- a little over half an hour. Um, wow, I can't do math. And then, uh, yeah, okay, I can, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know what time it is. I don't know where I am. Um, so at 1030, we've got the Sunday School Christmas program, which is great. It's going to be fantastic, so please stick around if you're able to, to enjoy and witness the proclamation that the kids are going to bring of, of Jesus' birth. Also, there's a youth Christmas party uh, for junior high and senior high at uh, my house at uh, what? what? Four, four, four to six. Four to six. So if you come at five, you'll be on time. <laughs> uh, uh, but you can show up at four. If you show up at three, I'm not going to be upset. We can hang out. Uh, and if you stay after six, that's totally fine with me too. Uh, well, yeah, Everly would love that. Uh, so also uh, Christmas Eve candlelight worship at uh, five on the 24th, 5 p.m. on the 24th, and then Christmas Day worship at nine o'clock uh, on the 25th. So uh, let's see. Any other announcements? this morning. Greg. As of August, um, this year there was, I gotta remember here now, there were 49 polar households. Of those, uh, 30 were individuals and then the other ones were families for the time being. So just so you know, that's what we're looking at right now. Um, we are still looking for 
Thanks, Craig. So if, if you're not familiar with what that program is, it's a program that Good Shepherd is partnering with United Way that United Way has created called Hope Haven in partnership with the Alexandria Community Churches uh, around the area to help support uh, not, not just homeless individuals, but now this year ramping up to uh, families who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, and so we've joined with United Way to help out that. Uh, so if you're interested in, in helping out in that way, if uh, you're interested in learning more about it, uh, the, you can talk to Greg, uh, and there's sign-up sheets in the back uh, if you're interested in helping out uh, through those three ways. All right, any other announcements this morning? All right, well, uh, early, if, if, if I don't see you guys next week, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? I want to say Merry Christmas if I don't see you next week, but I would look forward to seeing you all at Christmas Eve and Christmas Day as we celebrate Jesus' birth. So Merry Christmas.